911, what's the nature of your emergency? What is up, police, fire, military, and families? My name is Ashley Walton. I'm here with my friend, Sean Wyman. Sean, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Thank you, Ashley. We also want to thank you listening in on the Tactical Living podcast. Today is a pretty exciting morning. I am over here on the east, on the west coast. You're over there on the east coast, Sean. East coast. Of, um, yeah, I'm in California. You're in Florida. So we, we share really good weather that a lot of people are oftentimes jealous of. Yeah, it's beautiful this morning here. Yeah, same here. So, Sean, if you don't mind, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and um, why we should listen to you? Sure. So my name is uh, Sean Wyman. I am a 20-year law enforcement officer professional, uh, eight-year military veteran before that, Army Ranger. Uh, went through a lot of adverse challenges, a lot of uh, adverse experiences growing up that really helped me to uh, to push through, if you will, and uh, to get to where I'm at now. And my, my passion is actually working specifically with public safety through training, teaching them a tactical emotional adversity management system, because I believe that's one of the places where we have failed miserably when it comes to our profession and, and the training aspect, because in the end, you know, we kill ourselves far more than anything that we train that could kill us. And when I realized that, that really got to me. So really started focusing on that aspect. And, and that's really where um, our focus is with our new company called Going Beyond the Call. Awesome. Are you still um, active? You're still working? I am. I'm still active. I've got uh, hopefully about five, just under five years now left. So. I asked that, Sean, because I was checking out your website and you are like all over the place. You're, you're an author that you do public speaking, you do training. Like there's, there's so much that you do. I think it's awesome. And um, you, you spoke to the effect of some of the adversities that you dealt with while you were growing up. What were some of those? Okay. So my dad left when I was born. Um, you know, my, I was a single, my mom was a single mom for a few years till I was about seven then we moved to Washington, D.C. She met a guy that she just fell madly in love with. He ended up being very abusive, both to my mother and I. I was mentally and physically abused for over three years. My mom was for much, much, much longer than that. And um, the, you know, the, the challenges that came along with that, not just with dealing with the abuse, but my mom being white, my stepfather being black, living in a predominantly uh you know minority area where i was the minority which you know it's kind of crazy you think about it right but i was really you know like one of three white kids in my entire school not class school and so there was just a lot of uh of, of tension and uh, a lot of challenges there and as i came through that um when i was 10 i tell people i was one trigger pull away from my life changing forever to where I wouldn't be here today having these conversations with you and all these amazing people. And, you know, my stepfather beat me to the point where I couldn't move for an entire week. And when that happened, I got so angry, so homicidal, if you will, that I planned how I was going to shoot and kill my stepfather. And I went all the way up to just before the point of execution. And I, I thank God every day that I didn't pull the trigger. Even when my finger was in the trigger, I didn't pull the trigger. I put the gun down. That led me into foster care. I was in foster care from 10 to 18. Of course, I started really um, struggling because I didn't ever deal with this crap. I didn't deal with the abuse, the emotions, the all of the trauma that came with um, those challenges. So I started, you know, not even realizing it, but I started trying to find my own coping mechanism. So experimenting with drugs, obviously, that was an easy one because just the people I was hanging out with. Alcohol became my vice. I drank from the age of 12 until I was 27 years old. And, uh, you know, so it was just like one thing after another, Ashley, because, you know, you have this negativity and this, um, you know, these emotional issues and trauma issues. And when you don't deal with those things, especially as a little kid, you know, you just kind of move down this path of, of self-destruction, if you will. And that's really what I was doing all the way into my 20s, really, until I got the job at Tallahassee Police Department. Because in the military, 
you know, I got into the army when I was about 20, uh, I was 19, uh, almost 20. And I remember, you know, drinking was cool. Like, man, you could drink as much as you want, as long as you can run those 10 milers, you know, at 5 a.m. They mm-hmm. didn't really care. So, and, and being angry was cool because they, they loved that violence of action, right? That's what it was all about was, you know, we were, a, you know, military fighting force and, and that's what it was about was violence of action. So the military really fed me, but at the same time, it also became my father figure. It also helped me to begin to recognize mm-hmm. that I was strong, that, um, that there was this other side of me that I had never discovered that the military forced me to discover, especially going through ranger school, facing a near death experience, you know, all those kinds of things. So now that leads up to, uh, you know, right before I get out of the military, three years before I get married, I see my wife maybe six months out of three years. I end up divorced. Um, as we're getting divorced, we, you know, we have a child together. So now here I am, 27 years old. I get the job at the agency where I'm at now. I'm 27 years old. I hate my mother because I feel like she abandoned me. I hate my stepfather. I never dealt with the fact that I almost shot and killed him. I never dealt with the mental and physical and emotional trauma that came with the abuse and all the different challenges with those aspects. Never dealt with the the fighting and the the, the broken noses and you know just all of the different things. Right? I never dealt with any of that. And on top of that, now I'm recently divorced. I'm $150,000 in debt. I'm a single father. I mean the list just keeps going on and on and on and on. And I'm the guy – that's showing up when you're at your worst as a citizen. I, the officer, am supposed to show up at my best, and this is what was showing up at your front door. Let me ask your audience, right? Would you want me then showing up at your front door? Because that's what was happening was I'm showing up at your front door. I'm still having dealt with my own issues, and you know that, that that's where I was at at 27. <laughs> I can, I'm feeding off of your energy right now, and I can tell how passionate you are, and you're certainly a seasoned public speaker because to take something so heavy and to to give it to us the way that you just did, if, if we can just go back for a second, because you made mention that before you even became a teenager, you had your hand on the trigger, and I'm, I'm wondering what your mindset was in that moment and what made you decide not to pull the trigger. So that that is a great question, and so I'm not a teen. I'm 10 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm not even a teenager, um, and honestly – I don't know because I was pulling the trigger back and, you know, like I'm a law enforcement officer, firearms instructor. So I understand the the technical terms now, Mm -hmm. which I didn't then, but literally I pointed the firearm one handed. My mom was on the right side. My stepfather was on the left side. Both of them were sound asleep. My step, my stepfather kept a small 22 caliber handgun in his back left pocket. I reached in there. It was right there. I went to the foot of the bed. I punched the gun out. I started pulling the slack out of the trigger. And at the very last second before the gun went bang, I took my finger off the trigger. I put the gun down between my stepfather and my mom. And I got my backpack and I and I ran away. And I call it divine intervention, Ashley. That's the only thing I can call it at this point. I really don't have any other. I've thought about that moment many, many times, even as I was writing my book about this. Um, I, I thought about it many, many times as far as what the hell stopped me. And the only thing I can say is divine intervention at that point. Hmm. Did your mom and your stepfather ever know that that happened? Oh, yeah. Before because, you came public? Absolutely. Because when they woke up the next day, the gun was between them. And I, I go mm-hmm. back and I think about that now. I never thought about that until I really started healing and dealing with the emotions and the feelings and the trauma that I needed to deal with. And then I started thinking about that. And that's how I began to recognize that my mom never abandoned me. My mom saved my life because I can't even imagine what it was like for my mother waking up, seeing the 22 between my stepfather and her. And I, 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 who woke up first? Who saw it? Did my stepfather see it? Did my mom see it? Did they both wake up? I have no idea. I've never asked my mom that question, so I really don't know. But um, I know for me, I always wonder, man, what was it like in that moment when they woke up? So I know they knew, and I know my mom. Like I said, they found me three days later after I ran away. They called my mom. They said, hey, we have your son. Great news. We're bringing him home. And she's like, no, 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 no. He can never, ever, ever come back here again. 
And that was, and that was the beginning of the new part of my journey. Yeah. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Clint. Clint says, you said it exactly right. How can you show up for others if you can't even show up for yourself? And and we hear that all the time and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but um, take us. So let's, let's fast back forward to where, where we had kind of stopped. I took us back there for a second. I'm just super curious and, and selfish about your story, but Go for it. what made you decide to, get into military in the first place and then become a police officer? <laughs> well, first of all, military was my only, like at the time, like I, I barely made it through high school, Ashley. Right. I mean, I'm talking about skin of my teeth made it through high school. I was, I worked, I worked a lot, man, from 12 on I worked. I, and that's really fed my alcohol too, because I worked in a seafood restaurant that had alcohol. And so at 12, I'm stocking beer coolers with the owner's son. We're sitting in the back drinking beers, and taking whiskey at night when I leave. I mean, it was it was crazy, man. We you know we had access to more alcohol than we knew what to do with. So I'm working. I'm making you know a hundred dollars a week as a as a 12 year old. So I have all this money, which no, I didn't invest any of it. It all got spent. I go back and look at that now and go, man, if I would have if I had been a smarter kid, right? But, um, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, um, I was working a lot. I, um, like I said, it was easy to get out access to the alcohol and it was, um, it was, like I said, man, it was a challenge. So when I turned 18, I decided I wanted to be a police officer that that was like, those were some of the most positive influences in a negative world for me was law enforcement. And I believe that's why I'm so passionate still to this day about what I do and serve at the level that I do, because I really believe that we are change makers far more than just first line of defense. Yeah, we, we, you know, we kick butt and save lives when we need to, but we're so much more than that. And I wish we would emphasize it more. And that's one of the things that I'm really working on is we're, we're, we're not just the first line of defense. We're also the first line of healing if we train mm-hmm. right and we teach people how to recognize how to do that. So that being said, I went to become a law enforcement officer. I went back to Albuquerque, New Mexico, because I thought everything would be, you know, sunshine and rainbows when I went back there that, that I'd be happy again. Wasn't the case, but I was applying to be a police officer. I didn't get the job. I'm angry because I just knew I had this job and at the, I went through all the process, everything went really well. And then you get in front of the board and you know, you're like, I got it. I know I got it. I'm just this punk kid at this point. Right. I'm like somebody who thinks they know it all. Like most, you know, teenagers at that point. And they go, look, you you look really young. It shows a lot of immaturity. We don't think you're ready to take this job mm-hmm. yet. We want you to stay one more year. And granted, we're making like five, 25 an hour at that point right so of course you would think i'd be like hey guys thank you so much i really appreciate the opportunity i'm going to work even harder no 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 (laughs) ego gets in the way you made the worst mistake of your freaking life i didn't say freaking though right i said and I, i storm out the door like an angry little child and I get in my car and I'm driving down the road and all of a sudden I look over on the um, on the left side. And there's this big shopping center and there it is. Army recruiting station. Wow. And I pull in and of course, they're, you know, you know, the recruiters are in there and they're like, yeah, you can, you know, you can, you know, do this and do that. And blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know what? I got I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't have any other choice. And I really felt at that point I didn't have any other choice. And so that's why I ended up going in. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made. We, we thank you so much for your service. And I mean, you, you had made mention already of like intervention when there's this giant sign in front of you like that. Like it just can't be any more blatant. <laughs> Good morning, no. Jim. So if you can walk us through then. So you get into the military and what was the transition into becoming a police officer? So I had to make choices, right? When my, um, when my ex-wife now, when my son was born, she basically thought I was just going to go and stay in the military and let her raise our kid. And I I wasn't going to be worried about seeing them. Like she totally misinterpreted who I was and, and what I believed in. And so when my son was born, I had to make a decision because they, I was coming up at the end of my tour I wanted to stay in. I really did. And I was trying to find a way to do it. 
And I said, look, I, I need to go to drill sergeant school or, um, or be a recruiter for the next three to four years. If you just give me that, I'll go anywhere in the world after that, anywhere. And they were like, hey, I'm really sorry. Those aren't available right now. Uh, the only place we have for you is Fort Lewis, which is Seattle, right? That's Washington. That's clear across the country from Florida. And so I had to make a tough choice. And I said, you know what? I can't leave my son. My dad left me. My mom left me because it's still I'm in that mindset at that time that my mom left me. I said, I can't do it. So I started applying for law enforcement jobs. I started looking at um, where I could get hired. And um, I got, you know, I, I put my applications in and uh, the agency that I work for now, Tallahassee Police Department, that's who hired me. And I've been here ever since. That's awesome. You made mention of you still being in that mindset of, of knowing that there's some some heavy trauma that you're still carrying. And I know that you help so many people now transition out of that. So how did you yourself transition out of that? OK, guys, this is again. I, and I, I well, I make no apologies for what I believe in. But at the same time, I understand that other people believe what they believe. So I want to respect that. But this is so this is coming from my perspective. As I started this job. I wanted this job and I wanted to do well in this job. And I knew that as an alcoholic at the time, drinking the way I was drinking and doing the things I was doing, it was going to be self-destructive and I was going to end up, I was going to end up in a bad place and I would probably lose my job, lose my profession. I didn't want to be, I, I never wanted to fall into the circumstances that I had grown up in. If that makes sense. I didn't want to be poor. I didn't want to um, be an abuser. I didn't want to be in abusive relationships. I, I didn't, I wanted children and I, and I wanted to love my children. I wanted to be a good father. Right. So all of those things kind of built upon, um, the, 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 um, the process, if you will. And so when I met my wife now that I've been married to for 15 years, um, it all kind of started there because I, I, I was led back to my faith. Um, I really started, uh, you know, going back into, you know, reading the Bible. I got into, I went to an event. It was like a weekend retreat. It was really there where I had that aha moment that we all get at some point in our life. And it was, look, there's so much that you can do with yourself, but until you go back and let go of your past and deal with that, you can't move forward. And so I really took that to heart. It came through a scripture. And I read that scripture over and over again, and I remember crying, like bawling my eyes out and saying, I, I, I got to let this go. I got to let this go. And, you know, that's what I started doing. I, I went on a mission to go back, address the pain, address the trauma, address the emotions, and do everything I possibly could to say, I'm free of it, man. I'm not going to let this hold me down anymore. And look, guys, that took time this wasn't like an overnight okay i'm healed i'm good look it takes a long time to get to that place it takes a little while to get out but the good news is you can get out anybody can get out of it if they understand and it's what i call the movement process that i that i learned through this whole thing and that's why i wrote the book that i wrote because it talked about how to let go of your past and move forward in your life, no matter what you've dealt with through your, uh, you know, through your adverse experiences. Yeah, for sure. Good morning, Michelle. Uh, we have to change the generation, generational curses. Absolutely. So what is it that you're doing now after having been this 10 year old boy, having a gun in your hand, almost murdering your stepfather, making that shift intervention came, you decided not to do that really hard. You go into the adoption system. I can't even imagine what that must have been like joining the military after you had already been denied from uh, becoming a police officer and then later becoming a police officer, having that healing moment, having your wife, spirituality, all of these things that came into your life, you literally sound like you became this entirely different man. And now you're giving that to other people. So how are you, how are you doing that to show up for other people who might have been in that dark place? Well, that's a great question. And it, it started with my first book. I wrote my first book, that led to speaking engagements where I started talking to people and um, and people were coming up and asking me, like, are you serious? Did this really work? And I'm like, yeah, this actually worked. And movement is actually a process. It's a legitimate process. It's an acronym that I broke down 
and it, and it focuses on on really the the what seven eight elements it's mindset opportunity vision empowerment and you have to have those first four because without those first four you can't go anywhere if you can't learn how to move you can't go anywhere right so you have to have the right mindset mindset is everything i know you guys hear this all the time mindset is everything and it absolutely is so mindset leads to better opportunities. Better opportunities lead to clear vision. Clear vision leads to empowerment, right? When you learn how to move, that creates momentum, right? So you once once everything's in motion and it starts to move, how do we keep that? How do we keep that focused, right? So then it's about the education, educating yourself. Knowledge is power, right? Not just book knowledge, but just – you know, all the amazing information that's out there, the data that's out there, training programs, uh, coaches, you know, whatever it is, whatever you feed off of that helps you to get the knowledge base that you need, the awareness, right? And then it comes to a navigation aspect. Where am I now? Where's my end goal? Where, how do I get there? Can I go a straight line? Do I need to go on a, on, a, on a diverted path? What happens when these obstacles get in my way? Do I go through them? Do I go around them? Do I go over them? How do I do those things, right? But once you have all those things aligned, then you have the transformation, and that's where I'm at now. That's what you see now is the transformation from pain and, and um, trauma and emotional damage to recovery, right, to, um, to uh, happiness, to <clears> – <throat> excuse me, to uh, um, just a feeling of being able to truly let go – so you can do the bigger things that you want to do in life. And it's it's an amazing feeling to be able to do those things. So it started with that book. It started with that kind of process. And then as I was going through that, I really started looking at um, the adverse childhood experiences. Like I became really interested in that, especially with my past. And this all started as like personal um, wanting to learn and get awareness and understanding. And as I saw that, it evolved into, huh this could really work well for law enforcement. And so I began to look at the transition of helping law enforcement officers to understand how adverse experiences of other human beings, which is 67% of our population, by the way, right, that have had some form of an adverse experience in their life. How do you teach law enforcement officers who are type A, rough and tough, hey, we got to suck it up and drive on. How do we teach them to go, hey, 67% of the population has gone through some brokenness, some trauma, some emotional stuff. So by the time you get there, they are already in a bad state. You get the option of making it better or making it worse, and it all starts with how you show up. So I really got focused on that. And then as I got focused on that, I began to recognize how big it was because I looked at the law enforcement suicides, and I was just blown away specifically the state of Florida now for the last five years in the top five across the country when it comes to law enforcement suicide. And we're on our way to being in the top six um, at the rate we're going right now or for the last six years in the top five, which I really hope that's not the case, but we're definitely going down that path right now. So as I saw that, I was like, okay, you know what? I really want to do something that focuses towards um, law enforcement. And then I started looking at firefighters and EMS and dispatchers and corrections. And I recognized, holy cow, the whole public safety industry is self-destructive. It's not just police officers. So that's when I partnered with my friend D up in Canada and we wrote our second book. And that one focuses on um, mental health fitness for public safety professionals and, and giving them the training and the knowledge base to be able to have this tool, I call again, I call it a team's aspect because it's a tactical, emotional, adversity management system in place that you can use anywhere you go, no matter what call you're on, no matter how simple or how complex you have that tool in your toolbox that you're able to apply. Yeah, yeah, that that is incredible. That's amazing. And congratulations on <laughs> authoring two books. That that is really amazing. Thank um, you. I'm not sure who this is. You'll have to enable your comments for StreamYard. It says I recommend Sean's book. By the way, Sean, here's the review that I promised. I love it. <laughs> uh, good morning, Bunny. So Jim says the generational curse. Do you think that it can be addressed in the training academies? A change in their approach to indoctrinating these newbies that have no idea about what they are getting into. Jim, 100. percent 
100%. It has to start there. Actually, I think it needs to start in colleges. I think it needs to start in the criminal justice program. I think there needs to be an intro to mental health, the mental health aspect of the job at that level. But the academies, 100%. You're right. It's hard to take a guy like me who's been in 20, 25 years and go, hey, we want you to change your whole philosophy and way of thinking about poli- not just the way you police, but the way you serve in your community because they're like, ah, I've been doing this job 20, you know, they, they have that mindset. And those people are being forced out. And you have a new generation that is more open to what we're talking about. And yeah. I definitely believe that if we are doing this in the academies, as they evolve, and they get experience and they get into the command staff aspect and the administrations, they will be the ones that, that will evolutionize the change that really needs to come down the road. And it probably won't come in my, in my lifetime. It probably won't. I, I'm really hoping that I get to be a catalyst and a, a start point, but it, you know, it probably will take about, you know, eh, I might get to see it, right. It, it'll probably take, you know, 10 to 15 years to get legitimate evolution of change to change the mindset of suck it up and drive on to hey it's okay to not be okay right because everybody now you know every, you know, that's the big thing right now right it's okay to not be okay but it's one thing to say it it's another thing to believe it mm-hmm. and that's where we're at right now is everybody wants to say you know all these things but it's about really believing it and not just not just saying it but actually applying it the application of it so jim that's a great question and i highly highly agree that um, we can start at the academy level and, and take it out from there. But I also feel that we need to also get it into our um, our FTO programs, our field training officer programs, and our in-service programs as well because they deserve to have this training or have the opportunity to know that this training exists because otherwise we allow them to just fall down the broken path with, with no opportunity to, uh, to step off of it. For sure. And it's great that you said that because that was the first thing that came to my mind. My husband is also an FTO. And if they've already missed out on the opportunity from the academy, then really that could be the very last shot to be able to kind of frame them. And you're right. This generation is incredibly open and and willing to be moldable when it comes to these types of, of practices. And Jim also wants to know, so what's the secret to getting the foot in the door to facilitate that in the Leo world? It's very difficult. And, uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the secret is persistence. Continue because the conversation is not changing. The suicides are not stopping. And look, I love all these amazing suicide prevention programs and all these things. But look, suicide prevention is, is – how would suicide prevention work if you don't understand the basics to recognize when you need help, right? And if we were to start teaching that at the basic level, hey – this is the different types of traumas that you're going to see. You're going to go to events. You're going to have experiences. There's going to be effects. You need to learn to recognize, realize, and understand so you don't get re-traumatized from going to these calls over and over and over again, right? But we have to train that in order for them to understand that, in order for that to evolve so that suicide prevention can really do what it's meant to do to recognize when someone's in crisis and be able to help them in that moment of crisis. And now you're starting to see suicide prevention start to evolutionize as well and go, hey, we need to train on the front end because it's hard to catch them on the back end. They're not just – look, once you're in crisis, a lot of times you don't even realize you're in crisis anyway. So – why would you go to a suicide prevention place if you don't even realize you're in crisis? At that point, you're just looking for the darkest, coldest place that you can go to – and I hate for this to sound this way, but to end it, to be done because you can't take anymore. We got to get to them way before that. We got to help them to recognize at the beginning of that feeling and that emotion and that trauma – And we do that through so many – there's so many ways to attack that. One, a powerful administration that backs it, right? you got to have an administration that backs that type of training. Two, you've got to have good peer support that works. It's got to be legitimate. It can't be people that want to get promoted and stab people behind the back so you lose the trust aspect and you self-destruct your own program. And three, you've got to allow them to go get outside help if that's what they choose to do. You can't say, well, we're only going to be able to offer you assistance if you stay internal so we know what's going on. You've got to allow them to be able to go off on their own and get the help they need because sometimes – that's what they need, and they need to be allowed to have their 
their privacy. They need to be allowed to work through it the best way that they work through it. And everybody's trauma is different. Everybody uh, faces challenges in different ways. And so we all, all have our different ways of healing and adapting and evolving from what we deal with. Absolutely. A comment here says the dynamic that has to be changed will have to start with the upper level. The chief has to foster that or it won't work. Absolutely. And another thing that comes to mind, I don't want to forget to say this is if you're listening to this live right now or on the Tactical Living podcast, and this is something that resonates with you, maybe you are one of those OGs, maybe you know an OG, let them listen to this episode because the way to foster change where it's already that high up is to have so many people congregate underneath and to show the need to rise it above. So in, in saying that, and before we wrap this up, Sean, how can somebody get into any kind of training program with you or, you know, maybe be able to work with you a little bit closer, whether it's on a union level pulling you in or, or the different modalities that you do, you do provide. Definitely. So the, the, we have a, an information site. I don't call it a website. I call it an information site because it's really not a website platform. It's more to get information, learn more about what we're doing. And that is really easy. It's G B T C. 911.com of course you can connect with me through there um you can connect with uh you can connect with d or i whoever you're more comfortable with if you're up in canada uh deirdre's up there um and i'm over here in the united states right now and of course we're kind of in the hold pattern waiting for COVID 19 to uh you know to dissipate if you will or to, to kind of move on so we can move forward um you can also uh the book you can get a copy of the book let me show you. Let me show you my baby. I worked really hard on this thing. Um, get you, a, you know, a copy of this. It's on sale right now on Amazon. And if you go to GBTC Book, GBTCBook.com, you can get a copy of this. And it's half off right now. We took it half off um, during this entire time where we knew people really needed this type of information. So we put it out there. Um, the foreword was written by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. For those of you that know him. You know, um, it takes a lot to get someone like that to write a forward for a book like this. So um, a lot of great information in there. And it's look, if you are a dispatcher, a firefighter, EMS, law enforcement, corrections, anything that follows into public safety. And I'll even throw in medical, even though it's written towards um, law enforcement and public safety. Anybody that's in the medical field, anybody that's that's a, a essential worker right now can really benefit from the uh, the information that's in that book, and then I got to show my other one too, guys. This one's on Amazon as well. Hey, look, if you're in a place where you are um, broken, you are, um, uh, you know, you, you've never dealt with those adverse experiences. You know, you know in your heart, you know that you need to deal with it, but you just don't know how. You're just not sure. And guys, get a copy of this. And it's 100 pages. It's a really simple read. And I lay it out step by step. And I really believe that anybody that takes that process legitimately and applies it can work through it. And then if you have any questions, problems, comments, concerns, if you need help, reach out. Reach out to me. Reach out to D. Reach out to someone you know, love, and care about. Um, you know, someone that you feel you can trust that you can talk to, do not hold this in. Do not wait. I'm seeing now um, doctors that are committing suicide because of COVID-19. They're seeing so much death and so much destruction. And guys, that, that's us, man. We've been dealing with this for years and years and years. And so uh, with your help, with your help, with you reading the book, with you getting out there and sharing that, that you know, training like ours is out there, we can start to make a legitimate change and really focus on um, a, a change in the culture, if you will, about what we do and why we do it. Yeah, absolutely. Brian says, I did not know either until 2014 when I knew something was wrong with me. Yes, powerful admin is a must. Absolutely. How can anyone expect change if the head of the snake is leading the way? For sure. Um, absolutely. We are most definitely stronger in numbers, Eddie. And Clint says, that's so awesome. You got <laughs> Dave Grossman to write the forward for you. That That's a huge accomplishment in itself. And um, I know you're giving that's away a story. A that's a story in itself. It's, that was crazy, man. <laughs> hey, I got time. What's the story? Okay, great. So here's the story. So we start out, right? D and I, all right, well, it starts out with D and I, you know, take three o'clock in the morning. You got like four whiteboards. We're at my house and, you know, my wife's up. It's, it's three o'clock in the morning and we're talking about, hey, 
we want to do something. We, I'm like, hey, I've been studying this trauma informed care stuff, and there's some really cool, um, really cool aspects to it. And I think that it would be really beneficial to, you know, to put this stuff out. And then, so we start laying stuff out, and then Dee's like, oh, we could do this. And I'm like, oh, well, what about this? And then, like, seven o'clock in the morning, you know, we got like four whiteboards. I got, I still have a picture of it, four whiteboards loaded with information. So we're like, that's it. This is our book. We're going to do it. Let's go. So 18 months later, we come up with this monstrosity of a book. Can you see it? Uh, let me, yeah. uh, there we go. Right. <laughs> Look at this monstrosity, guys. A thousand pages of information. And we're like, yes, we got it. We got our book. We're ready. And then I go, well, wait a minute. Who's going to write the foreword? How do we get the foreword written? And so I start thinking who out there is one of the, Who's one of the most recognized names? Who would get this? Who would look honestly take a look at this? And the one name that kept coming to mind was Dave Grossman. So I'm talking to a friend at work, and he goes, well, you can call him. I'm like, what do you mean you can call him? He's like, well, you know, his, his number is his home phone number. I'm like, what? Get out of here. So I did. I call him. Hey, Dave, Sean Wyman, I would really love to talk to you. If you can find time to give me a call back, I'd really appreciate it. Short time later, calls me back. I say, hey, I have this book. I'd really like you to take a look at it. Former Army Ranger, law enforcement, and really trying to do something for the greater good. He says, okay, I'll tell you what. Um, find a place that's close to me. Come meet with me, and I'll give you 30 minutes, right, while I'm eating my – you know, Dave's a, a very uh, – like very light eater, if you will, right? He, so his 30 minutes is 30 minutes on the spot. So I go to Jacksonville with D. We take our 1,000-page book. I meet with Dave for 30 minutes, watch his seminar, put the book in his hands. He's looking at me like I'm crazy because I give him this 1,000-page manuscript, right? And he, you know, he's like looking at me like, seriously? And so he's like, all right, I'm going to do this, but I'll be honest with you, I normally don't do this. And I'll be honest with you, I probably, you know, chances are I, I won't write the forward but i'll be willing to take a look at it i'm like dave that's all i can ask man thank you so much so he takes the thousand page manuscript three months later we're not hearing anything man it's crickets and i'm going oh d we're gonna have to figure something out we're gonna have to go who can we oh man who's, who's gonna be the next one right who would be the next one that we're gonna get this to and i start thinking about that and then around right before thanksgiving the phone rings and it's dave grossman and he's like hey man and i'm like Who's this? And he's like, Dave. I'm like, Dave? Dave who? Dave Grossman, man. And like, you know, he's acting like we've known each other our whole lives. And I'm like, hey, Dave, how you doing? What's going on? And he's like, look, I looked at the book. It's incredible. Matter of fact, it's one of the most important works of our lifetime. I absolutely will write the forward for this and, and support you in this. And I was like, Dave, you – I'm like crying at this point. Like, you made my, you made my day, Dave. Thank you so much, right? I'm telling D, man, we're jumping around like little school kids, right? We're so excited. So Dave writes the forward. If you don't buy the book for anything else, buy the matter of fact. You don't even have to buy the book to read the forward. I'll give you the hack. Go to Amazon.com. Go to where the book is at, and you can read the first section there and read Dave Grossman's forward. If that doesn't motivate you, nothing will. Nothing will because when he wrote the foreword, I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. I mean, it was, I mean, it was like, you know, to have someone of that, at that level to, to say something so powerful about our book and, and uh, to support it has been absolutely amazing. And uh, by the way, Dave's got a new book coming out about spiritual combat. Make sure you check it out, man. It's so, I mean, I know he's super excited about it. Um, him and uh, Adam are uh, are putting that book together, and it's getting ready to come out like May fifth. So check him out and check out the new book. It's going to be really good. Awesome, awesome plug in. And Bob, that definitely was coffee. I pinky promise. <laughs> and um, I know that for one of our listeners, one of our viewers here live, they are not going to have to go to Amazon to look at that forward because you plan on giving away one of your books. Which book is it? Uh, w w which book would they give, give the audience the vote? Which book okay. would they? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little contest. So if you are listening right now, the very first person to enter in the comments, how old Sean was at the time that he had that gun in his hand and he made that, that one decision that changed the trajectory of his entire life. What was that age? Enter in the comments now. There has to be somebody. 
And um, who, whoever it is, we'll go ahead and I will link the two of you up in Messenger and then you can coordinate how you'll get the book over to them. And oh, yeah. I, I think your journey, your story is, is just incredible. No, Jim, it was not 23. <laughs> 12. Nope, Bob was not 12. Close. Eddie. Eddie Richardson got it. He's <laughs> already so got it, Ashley. Cool. That's awesome. And um, Eddie, it's Ashley. funny because... He's yeah. already got it. He has the book already? <laughs> yeah, I sent him the book. He just got it the other day. Oh, I love man. Eddie Richardson. Yes. Okay, well, we'll have to figure out what we're going to do about that because it, it is Eddie's. He he won it fair and square, so I don't know what he'll want to do with the book. Ask maybe Eddie what he wants to do with it. I have an interview with him in 20 minutes, so maybe he'll give it away on his interview. There you go. Eddie's awesome. <laughs> idea. Cool. Eddie's awesome. Well, Sean, thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing your journey with us. Clint and I will definitely be the ones to go on Amazon and purchase both books. And um, also the one coming out on in next month, May already. And I mean, it's just amazing to see your journey and now what you're doing in order to be able to help so many other people. And I truly applaud you. I'm so proud to know people like you. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for sharing time with us. Well, thank you for having a platform that allows me to get my voice out there to talk to people that really need to hear this. And I just hope that, you know, that this conversation won't be a dead end conversation, that this conversation will continue and that the chatter will get louder until the masses are louder than, you know, the administrations. And they have to listen at some point. They have to listen. I don't know what the number is going to be before they go, OK. We have a, you know, we, we talk about national pandemic with the COVID virus, obviously, right? When is it going to be? I mean, we've had people dying for years in our industry. When is that going to become a national pandemic? When is that going to become a, you know, a, a, a mainstream conversation, if you will, in, in what we're dealing with? Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Sean, thank you so much. I will go ahead and, and actually, I think Clint already left the link to your website inside of um, the comments. So thank you Clint, awesome. for doing that and enjoy your sunny Florida day as much as I enjoy this sunny California day. Hey, thank you. Thank you everybody for watching. Greatly appreciate you. And thank you again, Ashley. Take care.